I'm teaching a class this fall called Our Moon from Imagination to Inspiration, and I figured I'll use that as kind of the outline for this talk. And when we talk about Our Moon, there's a lot of ways to talk about it. Usually we jump to science and engineering, Apollo program, things like that. The moon has a lot of meaning through a lot of human history. One of the things we can look at is art. This is the oldest painting I can find so far of the moon. I'm sure there are older ones. It's from the 13th century. There's the moon right there. This one you are most probably familiar with. Sorry, night and Vincent Van Gogh. Um, there's the moon. The crescent is also kind of swirling, which is Van Gogh. <laughs> this one is uh, what I think one of my favorites because it's uh, it's just titled I Want, I Want. There's the moon and there's a ladder that this person just puts up there and just wants to get into the moon. In terms of movies, I don't know if you recognize this. This is a trip to the moon. It's a French movie. It is could be considered the first feature film of all time. Certainly, without much argument, the sort of first science fiction movie of all time. <laughs> So this is how they plan to get to the moon, is uh, basically with a cannon launch it. <laughs> cool. And uh, this is something you see when you talk about the history of film. This particular scene is what you see is the man on the moon and this projectile is landing on its eye. So, uh, so that's, that's from this movie. For this talk, I want to talk about the science because that's probably what you're most interested in. I want to start with a very fundamental question. How did the moon get there? One way to start doing this is to look at basic information like density, the moon is less dense than the Earth. So it's one of the clues we can use to figure out how the moon forms. Another is angular momentum. You've probably heard that the Earth moon system has a high angular momentum, but the Earth moon system does not have a high angular momentum. What is interesting is the ratio between the planet and the moon. If you plot the total angular momentum of all the planetary systems. The Earth moon system is special because most of the angular momentum is in the moon. So the moon's orbit has most of the system's angular momentum, and that's unique. The other clue we can look at are the ball soles of the moon. So this plot is showing the ratio of the moon to the Earth, the volatile content by temp condensation temperature. Sorry, yeah. Put it back on. Sure. With that um, Jupiter, is that the sum of all the moons? I'm using the four most massive moons. For each system, that adds up to four of the massive moons. But you could keep adding them a little bit to scale that. But they're, they're much smaller. Would you say Mars like the caption? Why is that too small? Are the satellites of Mars? Tiny. Why is that angular momentum so small? Because uh, the moons are tiny, right? The moons are tiny, and the way that it formed, people debate on how Mars moons formed. It could be captured asteroid. It could have been an impact event that put material into orbit. It's not very clear. Being very consistent. The outer planets? Yeah. Yeah. Saturn did but it includes rings? Not the rings, no. Okay. no. Yeah. I mean, they're not massive, but right. Yeah. They're very useful. Okay. I put this on GitHub so that people can use this. The moon has overall less volatiles than the Earth, hinting at the fact that it might have been heated at one point, and so when you heat the moon, you can lose volatiles. And one of the clues came from the Apollo program, where the astronauts picked up pieces, small fragments at first, of this very special type of rock called North Side. Genesis rock is from Apollo 15. This one rock is made out of one mineral, essentially. Go out, pick up a rock, not made out of one mineral, it's made out of many minerals. But this one rock is made out of one mineral, so it's very pure. How that particular rock formed was the most of the moon was molten. It had this magma ocean, it was just a ball of lava, and it cooled over time. That special type of rock that ends up on the surface is a result of this cooling process. It first happens from the bottom up, and this ball of magma is cooling. The first solids to form are more dense than the liquid it's in, so it sinks. It's the olivines, it's the pyroxenes, dense minerals that form that sink to the bottom. After about 80% of this magma ocean has solidified, that remaining bit, now something interesting starts to happen where there's a mineral, hydroclase, feldspar, it's the mineral, that forms those anorthosidic rocks. And what happens is that material is less dense than the magma. So it floats up to the top, it 
forms this flotation crust or a lid. At that point, you have material floating to the surface as well as sinking to the bottom, and then the moon fully crystallizes or solidifies. This is the lunar mag motion, it's one of the more fundamental models that governs a lot of things, including the crust. So if you look at the moon, brighter spots are, generally speaking, from this original crust. We're still stuck in the point of how did the moon form. We have these four clues I put together, angle momentum argument, the moon having less volatile than the Earth, the magma ocean that was there four and a half billion years ago, and the density contrast between the Earth and the moon. So four main clues that help us figure out how the moon formed. This is a canonical idea, canonical giant impact model, the idea that the proto-Earth was struck by a Mars-sized object. Here's Earth, Mars-sized object, Play the movie, they smashed into each other, a lot of debris was generated. The moon is the result of this debris accreting to form the moon. Those four clues I mentioned before angle momentum, the low volatiles, the density contract all of these can be fitted to this model. So it worked until about 2012. Uh, and what happened around 2012 was people started looking in detail to lunar samples and realized that the moon's isotopes seem to be very close to the Earth's isotopes. This plot is showing you various meteoric material, and you can see titanium isotope ratios. The Earth and the moon here are basically on the same line. They're like almost exactly the same. Uh, how did the moon form in this giant impact situation, yet keep these isotope ratios? And it's not just titanium, we're just fighting titanium. For it's oxygen and silicon. And there's a whole series that people have done by now. They all seem to be the same, the same thing, that they're all, almost identical. A canonical giant impact theory cannot really get to that. You form the moon and the earth in a slightly different way. You wouldn't be able to form the moon and the earth look almost exactly alike you know, in terms of isotopes. As these uh, results were coming, people were trying to modify the giant impact idea to fit this result as well. In addition to the four criteria we mentioned before, this fifth criteria of the isotopes was trying to be fitted. And one of the ideas was that it was a hit and run collision. Like the name suggests, it's a hit and no run. So the impactor runs away. The advantage of this is that the impactor disrupts the earth puts Earth material mostly into orbit, and from that is where the moon comes from. So another idea is that it was actually an equal mass impactor between two objects, another op model that seems to work to get the Earth moon system to look like that. The larger object obviously becomes the Earth, and some of the material becomes the moon. The isotope ratios for other inner planets, are they similar to the Earth if you're known at all? So they are different. I think there's one, a plot with Mars. I need to put that in the list. Do those alternate scenarios also require a Mars-sized um, object, or can it be smaller? The, the size is very. The previous one is equal mass. Hit and run. I'm not sure what the size is exactly. But no, the, the Mars size is from the canonical idea, so that, that object size could vary. There's many of these. Since 2012, there's probably 10 ideas that have modified the giant impact theory. The whole impacts, almost no one has talked about anything else. This is the, one of the ideas. Is instead of one impact, it's a series of impacts that occur on the Earth, putting material into orbit that accumulates and becomes the moon. You can't really escape this scenario. Whatever way the moon form, it formed very hot. That second phase of lunar history, this lunar magma motion period, is really not affected by the formation scenario necessarily. I showed you this before, I want to point out the timeline, which is kind of interesting and important. Going from the lunar magma motion phase to basically most of it being solidified, takes 10,000 years and you're gotten to 80% of it crystallized. The reason being, it's radiating to space, getting rid of energy really, really efficiently. After that, going from about 80% to fully solidified could take tens or hundreds of millions of years. And why is that? It's because this blanket forms on top, this flotation crust, so now it's a conduction limited problem. It's a much slower process. It slows everything down. So that's why cooling the last 20% takes the majority of the time. That previous cartoon makes it look very easy and simple. This cartoon is supposed to bring in a little more detail and show this process is rather involved. There's convection going on in the magma motion, which we can't model right now. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Part of this we kind of talked about magneto hydrodynamics and yes. the fact that the moon had a magnetic field that one way. Yes. Was there a magnetic field during that time period between the whatever the stratification or whatever color of that liquid ocean? It's hard to tell. There is an idea that there was one during this phase, but it's the 
but the problem is how do you know it? Generally speaking, the moon forming impact is late in solar system history. At least the canonical idea of a Mars sized object happening that's considered a late event. That's probably one of the last giant impacts that happened in the solar system world. Our first paper was very, very simplified. So this next one we're working on right now gets into a little bit more of the details of the impact process. So this is using a hydrocode modeling impacts. It's a little distorted because it's much longer than the screen. Here's the object. It's going to impact. This is the crust. It's plotting the temperature on your right. And damage, it's a measure of strain, total strain. So the damage of one means that it's strained more than its own length. So it's damaged, fully damaged. Play the movie and you can see what happens. It's a typical impact scenario in these hydrocodes. When you don't see normally, is this a lot of sloshing and a lot of fluid-like behavior. So it's essentially like dropping pebble to a pond. So you see a lot of ripples and fluid-like behavior. So we're doing a series of these simulations to understand what are the different outcomes depending on the size of the impactor, the velocity, the crustal thickness. We have four different types of outcomes that we've seen so far. You have the classical cratering scenario, if you have a small impact, it doesn't matter if there's magma beneath, it just makes a bowl-shaped small crater, and then it continues clockwise. You can have an impact fracture the crust, but not go through. You can have a partial penetration where the impact causes the crust to open up, but the material will fill back up. And uh, lastly, if the energies are high enough, it'll just blow out the crust and leave the magma that's exposed. Generally, these uh, magma oceans are modeled. Take the uh, initial chemistry of the magma ocean, so what was the composition of the magma ocean in terms of uh, more basic molecules. This is scenario B. So once you have an estimate for what the chemical composition of magma ocean was, then you based on experiments, figure out what are the minerals that will crystallize as a result. This particular chemical composition will crystallize olivine first, and then orthopyroxene and so on. It'll form different minerals as that pool of magma cools. It forms different minerals. Here it is just taking a parcel of magma, taking from 1700 Kelvin to bring it down to 10 Kelvin at 3 gigapascal at a fixed pressure. So the different composition, the amount of energy that's released is different. Change in enthalpy is different for the different compositions. In this particular case, it has to do with the MGO number. The more MGO you have, it releases more energy. Product negative. So you're controlled by, it seems like, two clients. Yeah. The density of the two objects. Yeah. And then There's angular momentum. Right. The, the density of the two objects, the Earth is basically, its density is controlled by iron. And then the density of the moon is controlled by silicon and other minor material. Right. But what is the composition of the, if you're just going from the impacts that are happening, the composition of the moon is different than yeah. the composition of the Earth and the composition of the moon came from the Earth. But how would it basically separate those elements? But it goes through differentiation, but in these scenarios, typically the iron sinks into the earth. Your interest in the moon and the Brazil effect? The Brazil nut effect was uh, just an interesting. I was, I was doing another project, and that, that happened. I was just interested in it. The moon is an obsession. That's a different story. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I tend to go in the paths of what's interesting, maybe at the time, or the moon is a long term thing. When did that start for you in the moon? When I was a kid, I saw Apollo 13, and so I wanted to be an astronaut. That's where the moon came from. Huh. So something about me when I see a disaster movie. Yeah, that was. That was <laughs> oh, yeah, it wasn't about Apollo 11. It was Apollo 13. It's like, yes, that's what I want to do. Um, but yeah, so unfortunately, not everyone can just sign up and be an astronaut. Maybe one day. So it's a matter of kind of staying as close to it as possible. How do you stay as close to the moon as possible? It's uh, flying rockets. It's flying airplanes. It's learning about them. It's you know, doing this. It's all these things are just kind of staying close as possible to you know, putting on a suit and go flying.